Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll take them out and we're going to turn to the Word of the Lord together this morning. Hallelujah. I believe the Lord has something He wants to speak to us today from the pages of His Word. John chapter 15 is where it's where we're heading today for our time together. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Brother Wayne, I'm going to do just a little different here, okay? John chapter 15. We've been in this passage for the last uh, about three weeks here in John 15. Jesus begins to talk about he is the true vine, the father's the gardener. You and I are the branches. He reiterates again and again and again the process where he says, remain in me. Stay close to me. Abide in me. And we found out that the key to living this life in this crazy mixed up world we're in, and the truth is, it is a crazy world today. It's a dangerous world physically, but it's a dangerous world spiritually We found the key to living, friend, is not happiness. It's not anything this world owns or uh, has the ability to acquire. The key to living is joy, joy that comes from heaven. And Jesus says in John 15 and verse 11, after he's told us to remain in him, after he's told us to abide in him, after he's told us all these things, he has said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We just spent some time in prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me right now, if you will. All I know to do is follow the leading of the Lord, and I, this is the, what I feel like the Lord is, has directed me in this morning. We're just going to pray right now, and I want to encourage you today to pray this prayer. Lord, I pray your joy will be in me. Lord, I don't need your joy around me. I pray your joy will be in me. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your joy. Would you just begin to pray that right where you're at? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, these are your people. These are your servants. These are your vessels. I pray that, Father, your joy would be in us. Lord, joy not from the world, but joy that comes from you. Jesus, we don't want anything else but your joy. We want your joy down on the inside of us. We want your joy on the inside of us. A joy that is unshakable. A joy that is full of hope. A joy that is full of life. And Lord, we pray today, God, Lord, as we would pour into a vessel, and that vessel would become full. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, as you look across this room, I pray that you would begin to pour joy from heaven into the vessels in this room. And I pray that the joy of the Lord would begin to flow into the vessels that have gathered here. And Lord, I pray that you'll not just pour a little bit of joy in, but Father, I ask today that you would pour your joy in, God, until it begins to overflow out of their lives. Joy, joy, begin to pour your joy into them, I pray. Pour your joy into us. God, we've tried happiness. Happiness doesn't work. We've tried the things of this world. They don't work. We ask today for your joy. A joy that the world's circumstances can't shake. That troubles in my life cannot shake. That uh, questions and concerns cannot shake. That doctor's reports cannot shake. That difficulties cannot shake. I pray a joy that comes from heaven. Lord Jesus, the joy that's in you, I pray it'll be in us today. 
fill these vessels. Lord, you said in your word that your joy would be in us, and as a result, our joy would be made complete, whole, and healthy. I pray spiritually healthy people in this room. I pray whole people in this room. I pray the joy of the Lord will be their strength. I pray the joy of the Lord will be the song in their heart. I pray the joy of the Lord will be the steady rock they could cling to in the midst of a storm. I pray the joy of the Lord will strengthen their arms as they battle in this life. I pray the joy of the Lord will be the song that fills their heart. I pray the joy of the Lord will be their companion as they walk through the valleys, the dark valleys of this life. I pray the joy of the Lord will be their companion. Joy. Joy. May your joy hold on to us when we can't hold on. May your joy keep us. Lord, may your joy be made complete in us, I pray. Father, I trust you for these things today. And I trust, Father, that you are accomplishing even now what you've destined for these people here in this room. I thank you, Father, for it. And I trust you for it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The word amen means so be it. So be it. So be it in your heart. And so be it in your life. John 15 is where we're going to stay for the remainder of our time together this morning. And... Um, I want to share, we've been talking about the key to living is joy. We talked about the key to joy is bearing fruit. Last week we talked about the fact the key to bearing fruit is abiding. And all of these, this, this uh, 15th chapter of John is a powerful chapter. And you'll find as you continue to read this chapter, there is more and more and more that he keeps pouring out into us. And the, uh, the first 10 verses, what you'll find, the first 10 verses are connecting points. Those connecting points are bringing us to a place uh, of completion. And it's in verse number 11. He says, where my joy may be in you. He said, I told you these things. Is how he begins verse number 11. I've told you these things so that my joy may be inside of you and that your joy then as a result will be complete. We talked about last week the key to bearing fruit is abiding or remaining in Jesus. And throughout this 15th chapter, he continually tells them to remain in him, to stay connected to the vine. We find that uh, we, 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 we strive so hard to make this Christian thing happen when in reality what we need to do is we need to capitalize our attention on abiding or remaining connected to the vine. And those things we've been trying to accomplish will come as a result. Listen, uh, it, it takes the frustration out of serving. We can get frustrated because sometimes we feel like I just can't get this thing down. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and that's the problem. He didn't call us to try. He called us to remain. He called us to abide. He called us to stay connected to him, and when that happens, we don't have to try anymore. It just naturally occurs in our life. Now, this morning, we're going to continue on. We talked about abiding and remaining, and the scripture says here in this 15th chapter, verse number 10, that the key to abiding is in obedience. The key to abiding is not found in obedience. John 15 and 10, he says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Now, the truth is this is one of those areas that doesn't get a lot of attention in our lives. Obedience is one of those words that uh, 
that I, I, I don't know what it is about the word obedience, but there's something about it that makes you bristle on the inside. Uh, especially when someone else tells us we need to obey. Usually the phrase comes, oh, really? Usually the thought comes, I don't have to do what you said. I can do my own thing. Obedience is one of those areas that doesn't get a lot of attention. The truth is we all want to bear fruit. We all want to abide. But the difficulty comes in serving Jesus when we have to obey. Obedience is something that we struggled with as children. And now we're all grown up. And how many of y'all know we still deal with obedience? We still want our own way. We still want our own plan. We want to do what we want. The truth is, as we read through the word of the Lord, there's many commands that uh, we are given to come into obedience with. And one of the things we often find frustrating in that is that there are some areas we can obey in and we do well in. They're, they're not hard for us. And then there's other areas we struggle in. Most of you that are parents, if you have raised more than one child in your house, you will find each one of those kids is a little bit different. Now, I know from what Paula has told me, at their house, it was her and her sister Cheryl. And when Cheryl would get in trouble, she didn't have to cry because Paula would cry for her. <laughs> they could look a little cross-eyed at Paula and she'd start crying immediately. Cheryl, on the other hand, they look at her and she'd bristle. And she'd get that look. Is it amazing in our own families how we can see the difference from one child to the next? In our lives, there are areas, friends, when we have no struggle with walking in obedience in. But then on the other hand, there's some areas that are a great struggle for us. It's kind of like juggling. I have never juggled. I don't intend to learn to juggle. But I've seen those individuals do so. And even the best jugglers out there, there comes a time when if they're thrown too many things, they can't keep up on all of them. And sometimes that's kind of how we began to feel when I'm trying to keep these things going and it seems like, well, I, I'm doing pretty good in these areas, but then maybe somebody throws me a scenario where I've got to forgive somebody who's really hurt me or I face some really big temptation and when that happens, then I get in trouble. The problem is, is that disobedience causes a fracture in our ability to abide in him. I want you to pick up on that thought this morning. Disobedience causes a fracture in our abiding there's a problem that takes place. Now, the good news is when we have walked in disobedience, and all of us in this room have, when we walk in disobedience, the good news is there's forgiveness. Can you say amen to that? Amen. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a shift that must take place in our minds regarding obedience. Obedience, friend, is not a to-do list. Obedience is not something that you've got to get accomplished. We see obedience like the juggling. It's all these things that I have to do, all these things that I'm constantly burdened down with. And in the middle of that thought, Jesus makes a point here in John 15, and he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If we try to juggle this obedience thing apart from him, friend, we're not going to be able to accomplish it. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting, I like this part, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How many of y'all are in an earthly body this morning? How many? Okay, I was getting worried. I thought we got to pray again. We're all in this earthly body. Notice what he says there. I live in this earthly body. How do I do it? By trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Philippians 2 and 13. I love this passage. For God is working in you. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, God is working in you. Even when you don't feel it, God's working in you. The scripture goes on to say, for God is working in you. Notice what he says here. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If people say to you, I just can't do it. I just can't obey God. I can't walk in God's ways. Then listen, friend, you've been trying it on your own. Because the Bible says he will give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. How many of y'all know that's a hard thing on your own self? That's a hard thing in my own strength. And the truth is, let's just be real for a minute. Sometimes we don't feel like obeying, do we? We just kind of want to paddle our own canoe. I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to do what I want to do. And the Bible says he gives us the, the uh, desire to walk in obedience. He gives us the desire to do these things. And then not only does he give us the desire, he gives us the power to do what pleases him. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Jude 24, now to him, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, notice this, without fault, and the last words, with great joy. Somebody say great joy. Great. He's able to present you before his heavenly father with great joy. No more guilt, no more shame because of his work. He is able, listen friend, he's able to keep you from stumbling. I've heard people say, yeah, but you know what? I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I may have did it. I may have done well today, but tomorrow is another day. Listen, he's able to keep you from stumbling. You don't have to stumble. You don't have to go that plan. He's able to keep you from stumbling. Jesus in you. Hear me this morning. Jesus in you is the power and the will to obey. He's the energy that enables us to obey. Obedience in the natural, it's a battle. We fight it. It's hard. And frankly, it's impossible when we try without abiding. When obedience is difficult, what do we do? When it's hard, when it's hard to make ourselves submit to him, what do we do? We yield to Christ who is in us. Remember the scripture says it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Jesus has the power and the will for you and I to obey. The key to abiding is in obedience. That word we don't like to hear. Number five, the key to obedience, this is a big key. The key to obedience is love. 
The key to obedience is love. Look at verses 9 through 14 there in John 15. He says, the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands, and notice this, remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. The key to obeying is love. Loving God, loving those around me, loving my family, loving my friends, and the Bible even goes as far as loving my enemies. You see, love for self is why we refuse to obey. And when that happens, the abiding is lost. The fruit that is on the tree begins to rot, and the joy that comes from it is drained from our lives. Abiding in his presence, obeying his word, all these things are driven by love. Love's not a feeling. Love's not an emotion. It's a choice because I love him. Because I love him, I choose to obey. Because I love him, I choose to abide in him. Jesus, in preparation for this teaching in John chapter 15, he says, if you go back one chapter to John 14, verse 23, he prefaces all that in saying this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So friends, when we choose to walk a path in disobedience, it's because we love self more than we love him. I know you probably should buckle your seatbelt. There may be a little turbulence this morning. I know that's strong, hard words, but it's the truth. It's the truth from the word. You see, when I refuse to obey and walk according to his will, it's because I want my will more than his will. What is it that will make me surrender and yield to his will and causes me to remain? It causes me to abide. It's all birthed out of my love for God. You see, we struggle on so many things. Well, if I can just get A, B, and C done, all the rest of it will fall into place. Jesus gave us this encouragement. Matthew 6 and verse 33, he said, seek first. Somebody say first. First. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Stop chasing after the things. Stop trying to make it happen. Stop trying to do it in your own way. Stop trying to juggle it all and just love him first. Love him first. Love him above all else. Now, there are some reasons why we as Christians often choose to obey. You've heard them and maybe you've said them yourself. People say, I obey because I'm a Christian and I'm bound to obey. I may not be where I want to be, but I have to be because I'm a Christian. Christians have to obey and I'm a Christian, so therefore I've got to obey. When this is the case, friend, you see the Christian life more as a set of rules and more as regulations instead of a life of joy that is found in abiding with Jesus. Let me give you this example. Honey, can I borrow you again? We, we've been together and uh, we've walked the journey of life together for almost 
about 30 years now, we've walked together through life. And, uh, you know, I don't have to do these things to try to make her happy. I don't, I don't have to hold her hand. I don't have to buy her things that she likes. I don't, I don't have to do all these things. Why do I do them? I don't do them. I don't, I don't go home and say, good Lord, I got to go buy Paul something today. <laughs> For crying out loud, I got to take her to dinner tonight. Don't want to take her to dinner tonight. I want to stay home. I want to do my thing, but I've got to take her to dinner. Got to keep her happy. Got to keep this marriage thing going good. It's not a burden because I love her. You see, my desire is to serve her, to make her life easier, to make her life better. Why? Because I love her. It's not out of my works. I don't have to get my phone. I, on my phone, I keep a to-do list. I don't have a to-do list that's Paula as the heading. <laughs> she said, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I don't have to have my to-do list with all the Paula things because I love her. So therefore, you know, I may forget to take out the trash. I may forget to do some other things in life. But I'm not going to forget about her. Why? Because I love her. You see, uh, I'm going to be real for a minute. Have you ever had folks ask you to do something and you're like, oh, I don't want to do that? You know, man, we had our Friday night planned and they just blew all our plans. Anybody ever feel that way? Okay, you're in church, you cannot lie. Yeah, we felt that way before. That's just life. Things happen, you're like, oh, man, I wanted to do my own thing, I had my own plan. And We feel that way because we don't love them the way that I love her. You see, there's some times that things come up for her that I've just got to shut down the other things and she needs my attention for a while. That's not a hard thing. That's not a problem because I love her and I want to serve her. Thank you, honey. <laughs> there's kudos that come with it. <laughs> Listen, we try to do this thing with Jesus. We find ourselves frustrated. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm, there's times we say, man, I, I got to read the Bible today. You know, I really, I want to watch TV. I got to read the Bible. Preacher said on Sunday, got to read the Bible. So I get my Bible out and, I've got to pray today. I've got so many things to do, but I've got to pray. And, and it's kind of like we have this sack on our back, and we're just constantly dragging this thing around, or it's kind of like the old ball and chain. It's like everywhere, I've got to, well, I've got to do this. I don't really want but I've got to do it. Friend, the more that I love him, the less it's work and the more it becomes a joy. Joy, I told you, we started with joy. Joy's coming back in. There is no joy in ball and chain. It's drudgery. It's a burden. It's everywhere you go. I can't get free of this thing. I want to be free. I can't get free. But friend, when you and I begin to serve him out of joy in our heart, love for him, joy will begin to fill you in the journey. It won't be the drudgery anymore. You see, it is a joy. All these years later, it's still a joy for me to love my wife. It's a joy for me to serve her. Why? Because I love her. You know, we've talked often. We got married 27 years ago, and we looked at each other and said, you know what, we thought we were madly in love then, but, but compared to how much we love each other now, I'm not even sure we loved each other then. I think we liked each other. The love has grown in depth. 
Friend, the more you walk with Jesus, the greater, the deeper the love will become. And the joy will come in the journey. The joy will come in the journey. The joy will come in the surrender. Joy will come in obedience. Joy will come in abiding. When I learn to love him more. But here's the danger. Here's the danger. Matthew 24 gives us these words. In the last days, the love of many will grow cold. What does that mean? That means there's some folk that were in love and it was red hot. Y'all remember that when you were newly married or dating men, you were madly in love. I mean, she was all you thought about. And he was, whoo, man, when he walked in the room, everybody else went into a shadow and the light came down on him. I mean, you were just, you were madly in love. It was on fire. You didn't care what your friends were doing. You were going to spend time with them. Have you found in life that over time, that love the madly in love settles into just love. And then love over time, if you're not careful, settles into common. Then it walks into complacency. And then the person that used to be madly in love with, you're spending most of your time, honestly, just mad. <laughs> just being honest. You're spending most of the time aggravated. And now, now, the, there's no light that comes on when they walk in the room. When they walk in the room, it's like you roll your eyes. This is the person you used to be madly in love with. What happened? What happened? Listen, friends, we can easily, over time and over situations, we can easily begin to fall out of love. The Bible says there's a danger in the last days that the love of many will grow cold. Listen, if love is the motivating factor of me obeying the word and if it's the motivating factor of me abiding, if it's the motivating factor of me bearing fruit, and if through love joy comes into my life, what happens when the love that I have for God begins to grow cold? I'm not going to abide as much, am I? The bearing the fruit is going to change. All these things are going to take a turnaround in my life. The Bible says in the last days, be careful, be careful, be careful. Because listen, there are people, there are people that I have known over the years, and you have known them as well. They're married. They've been married a long time. And they're, they're not even good friends anymore. They're just hanging out. They live at the same address, but that's about the only commonality that they have. Friends, we can sit in church every week and wear our spiritual wedding ring, if you will. We can name ourselves by the name of Christ, but yet we can be so distant from him in the love and the passion in our heart that we are not even moved when he walks into the room anymore. Let me tell you something that happened to me when I got married. I remember standing on the platform in Paul and I's home church, and I was standing there, and my dad was standing there. My dad was fishing the ceremony, and uh, all of my buddies were lined up with me. And then, you know, all the other, all the bridesmaids walked in the door, and I was like, oh, there, there's my sister, and there's my niece, and yeah, there's Cheryl, Paula's sister. Good to see y'all. Y'all get out the way. And after they got all the way, the ushers opened the door. And this lady stepped through the door. And it was kind of like I had never seen her before. And I can't tell you how many times, it's not just me. I can't tell you how many times I've been, while I've been a pastor, stood on this platform right here. And young men right here that act so big and bad and bold, she walks through the door and they start crying. I'm like, son, where's your manhood go? You're crying. <laughs> Stiffen up, son. <laughs> they are moved by her radiance. When she walked in, frankly, it didn't matter who else was there at the wedding. She was there. That's all that mattered. Friends, 
You and I can come to place when Jesus walks in. Father, give me the words. When Jesus walks into the church and, and we're not even moved. We just kind of, well, I don't, yeah. Okay, lift my hands again. Okay, I'll pray again if I have to. And Jesus walked in the room and we don't even care. We're oblivious. The fact he's even walked in the room. Has Jesus changed? No. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's changed? Me. 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 It's me. So I want to ask you today in closing, I want to ask you today, what's the condition of your love for God? I'm not saying do you love him. I'm not saying do you like God. I'm not saying do you're a Christian. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what's the condition of your love for God? The most dangerous place in a marriage I hear it all the time when people come in and they say, we need to sit down as a couple and we need some counseling. And one of them walks in the door and says, I just don't love them anymore like I used to love them. Dangerous words. Dangerous words. Friend, if I could stand, listen to me, it can happen standing in the pulpit to where I say, I don't love him like I used to love him. Listen, when I get to that place, obedience will be an issue. Abiding will be an issue. And the joy that was once there in my relationship with him will not be what it used to be because of my love for him. So I want to ask you today, I'm not asking about your spouse. I'm not asking about your friend. I'm not asking about your neighbor. I'm asking you today, one-on-one, me and you, What's the condition of your love for God? Today, are you fulfilling the scripture in Matthew 24 where it says in the last days, the love of many, it didn't say one or two, the love of many will grow cold. Cold. Coldness is not a good identifier for love. The love of many will grow cold. Can I ask you what's the condition of your love today for the Lord Jesus Christ? Friend, when you come to the place where the love is cold, it'll become work. It'll become tedious. It'll become a labor. And there will be no joy in serving the Lord. Would you bow your heads this morning? Holy Father. Holy Father, God, it's in humility that we're here before you today. I'm sorry, Father, for the days when we somehow think that we're, um, we're above all this. I'm sorry for the days, Father, when... Uh, we think we don't need to hear these things anymore. Father, I ask today that you look inside of us and I pray, God, you start with me. Would you talk to me and would you talk to these friends of mine that are gathered here? God, the truth is that I don't trust my own judgment on myself because I always go easy on me. So I ask you today, God, would you look inside of us? And would you, Father, today take inventory of our love for you? Father, if there's a sense of coldness, if there's a sense where the fire is beginning to die out, would you speak to us? God, I don't need somebody else to convince me. I need you to speak to me.
So, Lord, would you just help us to love you more today? I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry when I get so preoccupied with other things and I push you to the side. I'm sorry, Father, for the times when being with you becomes the burden of my day instead of the joy of my day. God, would you set a fire down in us? A fire, a passionate fire to love you more, to know you more, to seek after you more. We want to love you. We want to love you. Lord, you know the world we live in today. You know how it's pulling for the affection of our hearts. Help us to love you more, I pray. You are the power and the will to do in us. Lord, help us to return to the place of first love. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Revelation chapter 3, the angel of the Lord speaking to the church said, you've done all these great things. But nevertheless, I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. I think I've said all I need to say today. I think he has something he wants to do in us. And so this morning, again, I'm going to open the altars. I'm going to open this place as a place of prayer. You know. You know what? Listen to me. When there's something between our relationship, I don't need to talk to you. I need to talk to her. When there's something between you and the Father, you don't need to tell somebody, you need to talk to you and the Father. So this morning, that's what I want us to do. I want us to take some time and talk to the Father. Because I think the Father wants to talk to us. I think the Father wants to talk to us. So Paula, would you just lead us? And if she does, would you find a place of prayer? There's going to be no dismissal. When you're done praying, feel free to be dismissed. May his joy and strength be yours and his grace in abundance. Would you find a place of prayer? These altars are open. These front aisles are open. This choir is open. Let's find a place. Let's spend some time with God today. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Down in my soul, Lord. I want more of you.
Sure. 